Hi, I'm Monica Weitzel, the host of Community Hotline at Home. Today we'll be featuring the Black Resilience Fund. The Black Resilience Fund is an emergency fund dedicated to healing and resilience by providing immediate resources to Black Portlanders. Funds are being raised to help pay for a warm meal, groceries, unpaid bills, rent, and more with the utmost urgency. With us today is Cameron Witten, the co-founder of the Black Resilience Fund. Cameron, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Monica. You're welcome. You know, you are a community activist. You're a nonprofit leader. You're uh, you have uh, you've been a small business owner. So, I feel like you probably have as good a read on the pulse of the community as, as anybody around. And, and it's one of the reasons I wanted to invite you here today. Um, plus, you've, you've had work um, in founding a racial justice group called the, the Brown Hope, correct? Yes. So, as most everyone knows, the recent murder of George Floyd by the Minnesota police has, um, has mm-hmm. resulted in a really big, strong uh, reaction from the whole global community. Why do you think this particular uh, situation elicited such a strong reaction from people. What is it that's different? Thank you, Monica. I appreciate you asking me that question. And I think it's important to actually ask the question of uh, non-Black people uh, and of white Americans, why? Because uh, I, I I don't have that answer. Okay, uh, that's fair. Somebody that's who has been a Black Lives Matter activist since Black Lives Matter, uh, every time there's been an injustice, uh, I have seen uh, Black communities speaking up in outrage, demanding change and action today. Why now? You know, to be to be honest, you know, when I first heard about the murder of Judge F- George Floyd, I braced myself. This was not the first time where we literally heard, I can't breathe, as one of the final words of a black man dying on camera. This was not the most recent, this wasn't the, 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 this wasn't the first video that we had recently all viewed of a black man being uh, violently pursued and murdered. Ahmaud Arbery happened just weeks prior. We had Breonna Taylor just days before. And so, to be honest, when I first, started hearing about George Floyd and seeing the, the headlines, I braced myself. Because I knew that there was going to be outrage. There were people saying Black Lives Matter and thoughts and prayers and rallies. I knew that was going to happen. But I did not expect anything else. Because for the longest time, our bodies, our lives, and our futures have been seen as invaluable, as disposable. And so uh, I am asking white Americans and Portlanders and neighbors all the time. Why are you reacting differently this time? I don't think it's my place to answer that because I haven't changed my reaction. Black communities across this country, they haven't changed their reactions. We are seeing a difference in reaction from uh, elected officials, we're seeing it from companies, and we're seeing it from white Americans. And uh, I'd be curious to ask you, you know, and others, uh, why the reaction is different today. That's, that's very fair, and I appreciate that. And you're absolutely right. It, it, is, the, it is the reaction of white America that has changed. And, mm-hmm. and, and it, as it's sort of um, rippled throughout the, the world. Mm-hmm. And I honestly can't tell you either, Cameron, I'm, I'm relieved that it's, that it's finally come to that because it's been building up for a long time. And why it's taken so long, I don't know. But um, it really is it's um, a welcome change that people are finally waking up to it. And it's, it started some really interesting conversations. Mm -hmm. So these things that have gone on for years and years and years, we have not spoken up against them. And that is where we're complicit in the, in the, in the crime. Um, Does that sound reasonable to you? I mean, does that? Yeah, I, I, I would definitely agree that we have to take collective ownership we cannot just say, well, this was something that happened in Minnesota, or this is something that happened in Atlanta. We as a country are dealing with the reality that this is stolen land built by stolen people. And it is important for us to recognize how that has impacted us. You know, 
what I want this country to go through is healing. And I don't mean that just for our broken black bodies and our broken black futures. I, uh, you know, I've been a member of Portland, this Portland community for more than a decade. This is the widest major city in the United States. And, you know, uh, I, we all have relationships with people of all different races and ages and diversities and genders. And it's important for us to, to recognize that we all have healing to do. And I believe that for white Americans to have so much privilege, you know, unearned, never asked for, acknowledging that, but to go through life with so much privilege that you either do not understand, do are not aware, or do not care about the suffering of your own neighbors, of people who are literally right next to you that you don't care about or you don't know about, or you just think this is the status quo, these are the things, the way that things are. For you yeah. to be in that place shows a brokenness of heart and soul. And I grieve for that because that's a tragic place to be where you, your heart is so broken that you don't have space to show compassion to other people who are going through genuine suffering. And so I see this as an opportunity for healing, not just to be saving our lives, but to be saving the souls of people who have been asleep for far too long. Well said. It's kind of a reclaiming of our own humanity, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because when you dehumanize people, when you, de when you decide that they are not valuable enough, you're dehumanizing them. And that is part of your soul. That is, you're losing that joy and compassion that truly makes us the best of humanity. People are dealing with this in different ways. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there are people protesting. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, there are lots of wonderful, peaceful protests, and there's lots of great conversation going on. You dealt with this in a, in a different way. I mean, I personally, I'm not sure but how you dealt with this, but you, you, you took some action, mm -hmm. and you started the Black Resilience Fund. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so you know, we've been a part of a painful three weeks. Uh, that is an extension of a year that's challenged us to our core. And... Uh, I am so grateful to see the young, beautiful Black leaders who are emerging and really taking the reins for this movement and calling for systemic change. And we've got to listen to those leaders. And so um, as someone who's been involved with Black Lives Matter for seven years now and will continue to call for real systemic change, uh, also acknowledging that we must take immediate action to support those who are on the front lines, who've been directly impacted by systemic injustice. When we talk about oppression, uh, very often times, the way that we think about it is, well, you just change the policies and then everything's gonna be better. That is not true. Every act of injustice creates an injury. It creates trauma. Look at slavery. Just because you liberated enslaved Black people does not mean that the impacts, the sociological, the physiological impacts of slavery did not continue to impact Black Americans. It was passed on epigenetically across generations. To this day, people still experience higher stress levels and uh, health complications because of systemic injustices like slavery. Same thing with police brutality. We, you know, these murders did not recently happen in Portland or Atlanta. Or, uh, and these happened in Minnesota. They happened in Atlanta and other places. They didn't happen in Portland. But you're seeing the reactions here. Like people here got shot and killed recently because of trauma. People are reliving trauma that they've been experiencing for generations that have not been treated. And so we need not just to end the killing of us. We need to be able to thrive. Survival is not good enough. Just saying, great, well, we ended police shootings is not enough. So much damage has been done that we actually have to eliminate the barriers that make it impossible for most Black communities to feel welcome and supported and whole in this community. So a Black Resilience Fund was created as a recognition that we must change our systems, but we also have to create avenues for real healing so that folks 
can bring their full selves and all of their beautiful blackness into this community and for everyone in this community to celebrate that blackness, to engage our neighbors and to let them know that they are seen and we want to see them thrive, not just survive. And so we've created this as an opportunity to leverage healing and resilience for this entire community. And it's amazing to be sitting here in a time where we have the right to be angry. Mm -hmm. We do not need justification for why we are distressed, why we are upset, why we have lost hope. And yet Portland, because it's not just me, it's not just my co-founder Salome, it is thousands of Portlanders who have stepped up and has shown that even during some of our most trying and challenging times, we can show the best of ourselves. We've helped hundreds of Black Portlanders in less than two weeks' time, and we've heard comments from people who have said things like, holding that check in my hand was when I finally felt I could come up for air. And when I heard that comment, it just clicked for me. And I thought, in the middle of the I can't breathe era, and to hear a Black man say that he's coming up for air, and hear from other people who we have directly helped saying things like, your support is you know, fresh air to me. Uh, it's creating breathing room for my life. To hear those things during the era of I can't breathe, I find to be incredibly powerful. And it really speaks to what we can do to truly have healing in this community. And so I see the Black Resilience Fund as an opportunity to send a message, not just to Portland, but across the world of what healing can look like. And how can we really reconcile the injustices that we have ignored for far too long? That's beautifully said. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing how people can come together and how they can actually learn from each other and, and, and learn to heal together. There just has to be the the will to do it, and and I think once once there was this little groundswell of people talking about this whole situation and and trying to learn from each other, it just sort of blossomed. The Black Resilience Fund that you created really amazed me at the the response that it got. So you started it three weeks ago, you said. Two weeks ago. Two weeks. Two weeks ago. Yeah. How, Fifteen how days much, as of today. Can you, can you tell me how much money you have raised in that amount of time? As of this point, we have raised over $511,000 with the support of over 6,900 individual donations. And these are mostly all in the Portland area. Is that right? Or, or To be honest, point? it's been growing so fast that we are not able to track all of these <laughs> donations. We I are not. so astounded and grateful for the swell of generosity. And uh, we are working as hard as we can to use these funds in a responsible manner. Um, you know, we have zero overhead. This is 100% volunteer run. And we are working as much as we can to guarantee that we're putting this money into the hands of Black Portlanders as quickly as possible. To date, we've given out over $108,000 in less than two weeks time. And so it's been incredible to see the way that we've been responsive. And we've heard from a lot of the people that we've supported who uh, this is the first assistance they've gotten in months. These are folks who've been displaced because of COVID or in the middle of a pandemic. And they have been waiting for weeks to get an unemployment check. And many people who have called us just don't believe that there's actually someone there out there willing to help them. And so our checks are not as big as an unemployment check but because we got to them immediately and we saw them and we provided a service that was culturally specific, you know, the people who are doing intakes, the people who are at your door delivering you a check, these are Black Portlanders. So every Black Portlander is getting an opportunity during a time of isolation, during a time of great pain and trauma to be building community with other Black Portlanders and should truly be feeling supported. What are the things that people have been using the money for? Or what have they been asking for money for? Yeah, so uh, if you go to our website or our GoFundMe, we do daily updates to show fund allotments. And uh, we, you know, there is a form to, to, to request funds. And we do ask, what, do you, what is your biggest financial need right now? And uh, the two things that come up to the top are uh, um, rent, Rent assistance is huge, and then groceries. Mm. 
well, the basics of living, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. If you don't have that, you're, you're, you're sitting in a bad place. Um, so it, it, obviously you can't cover everybody's rent, uh, but are you able to just help make, um, make a dent in those and help them out with that or? It, it, we're just documenting the need. We're documenting the sheer injustice of wealth inequality. The racial inequality gap here between Black Americans and white Americans during this contemporary time is as bad as it was in the 1960s, in the height of Jim Crow and discrimination in America, pre-civil rights era. Right, and right. so it is startling to see that the wealth inequality is that big. And it's important to ex understand the context of where we are with the pandemic, where some people think, well, the pandemic impacts us all the same. That's not true. We are seeing those who are the poorest, those who are the most marginalized, again, experiencing the brunt of this crisis. And so um, we wish we could help pay for people's check, uh, uh, rents. We can't, but this is a call for us to know that we must do more. That's the reason why we've raised half a million, but our goal is to raise 1 million. We've already received applications from over 3,600 people requesting support. We are going into this with the intention to make sure that everyone who is eligible, every Black Portlander who comes to us for support can receive something substantial. We know that there's an abundance of resources. We know that the money is there to take care of everyone in this country. And we've got to be bold with demanding the basic dignity of human life. And so we're doing that with the Black Resilience Fund. We are raising a lot of money during a time of economic crisis because we know the money is there and we're making sure that those who need it the most so that they can focus on living their best life so they can focus on being contributing members of our society have the basics have food on their plate and a roof over their head that is not too much to ask and that is something that we can do together uh, that makes per perfect sense to me what other things um are you seeing people doing to to move this move this forward to, to work on uh, creating systemic change. I mean, I've seen a lot of conversations and there's um, obviously there's talk about the, you know, revamping or even defunding the, the police, uh, police departments. Um, is there anything you see that you see as really being helpful? That yes. So uh, the important thing is for this not to just become a moment, but a movement. We are seeing a lot of rapid, bold action being taken a very short period of time, but we're just getting started. The system has been broken for so long, we cannot expect for us to change it overnight. So it takes consistent, present action. Once the headlines are done, we cannot ignore. We cannot go back to the way things were. This is the wake up call for us to stay awake, not wait for another black body, not wait for the shame of this country having a seven minute video of a black man having his neck set on for the whole world to see. Do we really have to go through that again? Do, does our country really need that kind of shame on us for us to actually take persistent action to get justice for all of our communities? And so we've got to look at it systemically. We know that there is racial racism, that there's racial disparity in all of our systems, criminal justice, education, housing, our economy. And so it's important for us to be looking at George Floyd and his issue, but let's look at it through an intersectional lens. You know, yes, he was profiled by the police and he, his life was seen as expendable because of his blackness. But don't forget why they thought he was suspicious in the first place. They thought he had a forged check. He, they saw a black man at a grocery store and because black people experience poverty at a higher rate, we are criminalized. And so poverty is directly tied into criminalization. So as much as we're talking about police reform, we need to be talking about eliminating poverty and actually creating 
uh, economic wealth and prosperity for Black America. So that's what I'm focused on with the work of Brown Hope and the work of the Black Resilience Fund, recognizing that poverty is violence and we cannot tolerate that anymore. It doesn't make headlines. People who are literally dying because they can't afford to live. That is a crisis that's killing millions of Americans every single day, and we must take action now to stop it. Yeah, the systemic, the systemic work is going to take a long time to do. And, you know, you said something about, yeah, the, the killings may, may not have happened in Portland, but there have been. There have been some here, you know, and it's, we're, we're, not, we're not at all innocent in Portland either. So, Well, you know, the Portland was investigated by the Department of Justice for its killing and mistreatment of mentally ill Portlanders. And just a year or two ago, Portland had, you know, they settled that. And then a year or two ago, they had its highest record of, of killing of people in mental health crisis in a decade. And so, yeah, we are not innocent whatsoever. And uh, one thing that I am a little concerned about is there's been a lot of, you know, um, positive reception around having a new police chief. And in my time of being an activist just since 2011, I have now seen six new police chiefs. Just my short time of activism. So we know that the leader who's in place is not enough. We have to be looking more at the, the root causes. That's what we're calling for, defund the police. That is why I am standing behind the numerous community leaders and organizations that are calling for a 50 million budget cut and the police budget. And that is money that we can redirect into data proven strategies that are making our communities safer and helping to expand prosperity and opportunity to all of us. And so that's the idea of defund the police. This is not about getting rid of the police or not being safe anymore, but it's about investing in a better future that we know is gonna work that we all deserve, that we all want. We all want to invest in true safety. What we've currently been doing hasn't been working. We know it. We know crime rates are what they are. And we know that innocent people are dying or being locked up uh, all the time. And so this is us finally saying, hey, maybe let's not just keep having the same wheel spin over and over again, but let's actually invest in what we know is going to create a transformative and positive impact in our community. So I want us all to imagine what would happen if we took $50 million and reinvested that into education, if we invested that into community centers, if we invested that into treatment, into counseling, and actually helping to heal people and not just condemn and dehumanize them. What if we did that? Doing the same thing we've been doing all along hasn't worked, so it's time to look at something new, and that makes perfect sense. So, this um, it's a, it's a tough conversation. It's a tough conversation. I think I would I would encourage everybody to keep talking about it and keep you know figuring out their place in this and how how we can all make change. And, I, and I'm speaking for the white community. How can we how can we make change that's going to you know to actually help our community thrive and it's not not just one segment of the community um, and, to, and to realize that this has happened for uh, 400 years and it's, it's not it's not new it's not new at all and it's time um, is there anything else that you could tell us that you would like us to know either about the black resilience fund or the, the work that you're doing or um, just things that we need to know about in the community that that can help move us forward that maybe Thank we don't you. know about. Yeah, I would just love to uh, encourage folks to follow the work that we are doing uh, with the Black Resilience Fund and also with the parent organization for the Black Resilience Fund, which is uh, Brown Hope, it's a local nonprofit. And uh, the vision of Brown Hope is to do trauma-informed activism, not just how do we respond to issues of race and oppression, but how do we actually heal from the impacts of a racially unjust society? How can we actually look towards our future where we are all healed and can celebrate and thrive? 
So uh, please go to brownhope.org. Please sign up for the mailing list. Please sign up to be a monthly donor and help us be a part of this conversation to really make a transformative impact for the long term in this community. I love it. Thank you very much. And, and that, is, that, is that organization open to anyone? Uh, a, a yes, it is an organization that um, we work with everyone who wants to work with us to address racial justice. It is important for us to center the experiences of black, brown, indigenous leaders. It's important for us to recognize that too often we have gotten in the way of young leaders, of black, brown, indigenous leaders, and we need to create more platforms for them to lead and be seen. Uh, but we do work with people of all ages, uh, backgrounds, races, and more um, to together get to the healing that we all need to do to live in a racially just society that supports all of us. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you for your insights today. Thank you for um, clearing up some misconceptions and for, and for the hard work that you're doing in this area. It's, it's really important. And so I urge everyone to, to do the things that you have suggested. So thank you very much. And I know you've got a huge full day ahead of you, so I'll let you go, but um, we'll be talking again soon. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. And from all of us at Metro East out there, please be safe, be healthy, and please let your voice be heard. Thanks.